Welcome back to the Gleeman, everybody. Uh, I'm Vance here, joined by Drew. Hey, guys. And uh, today we are just going to talk about, uh, in general, the world building in Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time. What we love about it, maybe what we don't love about it. Uh, you know, pick, take some cherry-picking examples here and just kind of talk about them and see, see how it goes. Yeah, I think, Vance, we kind of wanted to set up for a series of culture dives, right? So uh, yeah, vaguely, I think this is like yeah, the so my, uh, backdoor pilot, so they say. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, my thought was kind of just world build, cultural world building. Mm -hmm. What you know was my thought to comment on what we could generally overview and look at, and that should set us up to dive into the various nations, people groups, etc. in right. weeks to come. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think we, uh, I mean, we definitely have enough cultures to pull from within the Wheel of Time. There is no shortage oh, yeah. of those. Uh, you can tell that that is one of the things Jordan was most interested in, uh, given the emphasis placed upon having so many unique and different cultures present. Very unique. Mm -hmm. Like, wow. It, you know, and one thing I'm really impressed is with, none of his cultures are lifts or ports of genuine cultures into his setting. Right. I would argue maybe Andor is yeah, Ring's closest. Probably, but, but I mean, they're this... I think Andor is more of the... Like, people say, well, that's supposed to be Britain or England, and I'm like, eh. I mean, it's not really, though, because I think Andor yeah. is literally a transplant of the general vague, like, plain fantasy Britain culture. It's not actually yeah. English. It's not actually like Britain at any time. It's this idea of those, of those cultures that has been put into fantasy. And he just lifted that idea out of like, right. you know, out of like, uh, uh, you know, other, other fantasy series that just are like, well, we don't have a setting. Well, let's just make it kingdom. Fantasy medieval. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and he, he did you know, move the timeline up, uh, and it's not purely medieval, but... Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, really, not at all, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I would... Mm, mm. Andor felt like a general vanilla Europe to me. Right, yeah, I think that's what I was trying to say, um, is that it's yeah. just vaguely whatever, like, medieval your kingdom you can Western think of. Western Europe. Yeah, yeah, well... Yeah. well I mean, I think even Central Europe has it has hallmarks of those as well. Okay. You know, German okay. kingdoms and princedoms and stuff like that. It's yeah. pretty closely uh, related to since England has Germanic heritage anyway. It's pretty right. closely related, right. um, and it's not so, going to be. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say. So in in that sense, Andor is probably the least interesting to comment on. To most fantasy readers. Right. I mean, yeah, it's the place we start off in, and it needed to be... It's the most grounded, I think, because it needed to be. Like, mm. we needed to have that sense most familiar. of familiarity to build the immersion and to make us focus on the characters more than the world at that point. Yeah. Because what he was fair. highlighting when he started the series was not so much the kingdom they were in, but who we were following and what they were running from and or fighting. Those were the right. big highlights that he wanted to set up. Um, yeah, and definitely. not so much the culture of Andor. Uh, despite right. the fact that it becomes center stage later on for a specific character's uh, subplot. Well, and is Two Rivers culture really Andoran culture at this point? No, I think... Or is it a subculture thereof? I think Two Rivers culture is like uh, his take on colonial America, specifically from... Yeah from the East Coast and around Charleston as he uh, maybe would have yeah. liked to think about it. Uh, I hadn't thought so. about that analogy, but the sentiments are They grow tobacco, there. for one. I mean, that's a big R well, American yeah. cash crop, so... Right. right. And N North Carolina and South Carolina both are two of the largest producing states, so... And both of which butt up against some misty mountains. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, here now we that go. you bring it up, right? Yeah, there yeah. we go. It's just they don't have a coast on the on the east side. That's it. So. Well, they kind of do. It's they just have the dry. river. Well, they have the river. Yeah. Well, it. 
I'm I'm playing off the very old world fact that Matt talks about finding. Was it Matt or Rand? Talk no, about they do. They talk about the sand sea creatures hills. in the yeah, sand hills. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. the sand hills are to the west, actually. I think. Are oh, they west the of east. the mountains? Yeah, because to the east, you you get down into like the mire in the southeast, and then you eventually oh, butt right. up against the you're river, right. the main river that, okay. that flows through. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, it's across the. It's either on the way to the mountains or on the other side of the mountains. I think it's on the way to the mountains that there's some yeah. sand dunes there. So it's actually right. to the west of the two rivers. Right. Well, yeah, so, so that's Andor. Emmonsfield. Yeah, right. Right. Andor, Emmonsfield, the two rivers. I mean, you know, so we have a vanilla Europe-esque situation, mm-hmm. a kind of a colonial transplant thereof. Right. Those and are moving probably... Out and yeah, those are the most direct lists, just to reiterate, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, so now, obviously, this is full spoilers, so I'm not really going to go in any genuine sequence it'll be of in how the title. we meet these cultures. Right, it'll be in the title, and there'll be a banner down at the bottom of the, uh, the screen somewhere, like right. here or here, whichever way the camera has got me flipped. So. so if you got here for this warning, it's your own fault. You already knew. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in the title. So, yeah, it, when I look at Shinar, uh, the Aiel tribes, the I, the Aiel clans, mm-hmm. even Tyr, there none of them feel none of them are direct lifts of any people group. Right. You know, not, none of them preserve in whole all of the Marais, attire, cuisine mm-hmm. of any group, and really they don't even feel like. You know, the, the Aiel don't feel like Bedouins who happen to be ginger. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know they're, they're not Arabic peoples, but oh, but they're redheads. Mm-hmm. You know, it none of it has that feel. He did an amazing job. Well, I heard him talk about how he wasn't even trying to mix and match. Right. He just had, he was very immersed mm-hmm. in cultural history. And there were a few key elements that came to him about a given people Mm -hmm. and then he would just reason through what other looking at the smorgasbord of of earth cultures Mm -hmm. how would this hypothetical culture develop and what trajectory would it take what elements would it likely invent pick up carry over and so all of his cultures feel very organic none of them feel falsified yeah i agree with that statement actually i think uh Probably it's the best representation of fictional peoples um, yeah. put to page, um, it, it's at least in the modern modern fantasy space. Uh, though Sanderson right. is is coming up. Here we go again with our our token Sanderson, <laughs> this, uh, Sanderson name drop, bug. right? Anywho, um, yeah, but I still think Jordan's probably going to have have the leg on him uh, throughout history. He's definitely focused yeah. far more on making these places feel real and unique. And I do like right. the point you brought up of how he would sit and think about the logical progression of how these cultures go. And I think the reason the Aiel are uh, the best example to go about this is we actually see the process he goes through in in the books. Uh, oh, right. You know, in the through Shadow the Rising. Pillars. Yeah, through the Glass Pillars. Right. So um, we see the process of them transforming from a 100% pacifist dedicated people into a warrior right. society um, that has elements, a little bit of elements of samurai, a little bit of elements of Zulu um, warriorship. Right. You know, it's just, it's fantastic. And none of it is and like... even... So, yeah, go ahead. Well, even, even their commitment to choice of weapons mm-hmm. and style of warfare are inherited from this evolution from a pacifist people, right? You know, and they and they have lingering taboos. Mm-hmm. You know, the the Tuathan are taboo to them for reasons completely unknown, right? But very realistically, the taboo is deeper than ever. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like he, you get such a, you get such an organic feel to their expression and culture. You because because it was really grown, it was really cultivated with a genuine history, like you're right. saying. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I mean, we you kind of get a little bit of that from from the other other cultures. Like you see a little bit of the hints of the Kyrian during the uh, the Kyrian and sorry 
during the uh, history of the Aiel, at least where the Aiel right. and Kyrianen had first met, and they became, you know, they had ended up having that long-standing tradition of allowing them trade and stuff due to past kindness they were showed by the people. Yeah. Uh, at least up until a certain point within in the Wheel of Time history, it was really relatively recent. Uh, so it's interesting that that even the relationships between cultures uh, feels real and organic. Like we are shown at, at so where we're at in the Wheel of Time. If anyone needs a refresher, is the Aiel and the Kyrianen actually have a bit of a feud going on during the time of the books. Like, Is that fair? I mean, there's what? animosity there, but, well, and the Kyrianen are disallowed. Yeah. Well, no, every, all wetlanders are disallowed travel, except for peddlers and, and the Tuathan. Well, and, and the Kyrianen, except because of what one of well, the kings used to be. did. Yes, right. That's right. what I'm getting into. Is that yeah. up until like 25 years before the books, the Kyrianen and the Aiel had probably had the status. best relationship that any nation has with the Aiel. Yes, there was a special right. status. Kyrianen merchants were allowed through the Aiel waste would, to go trade over at Shara and bring stuff back. And that meant yeah. that merchants from other nations had to go through the Kyrianen to get writs of permission saying that, hey, these guys, while they're not Kyrianen, here's a writ from, from the king of Kyrian saying they can pass freely. We've given them permission, so we would right. like the Aiel to honor the long-standing tradition of safe passage, right. and they would be given it. And uh, so you... Until they cut down that damn tree that they were gifted. Ah! And uh, what a dude, jerk. dude was like, I'm going to make me a chair. <laughs> so... You can see how the decision of one arrogant and stupid king of uh, Kyrian changed the entire outlook of the Aiel people towards them. Yeah, and now which really shut Kyrian, down the analog to the Silk Road. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that and that was that's a big deal. It was an economic blow to the world because currently right. the only way to get over to Shar is to the Sea Folk, and as we all know, they have their own bartering deals. Oh, speaking, and this is a good segue into another fantastic culture. Let's talk about oh, the yeah. uh, Athamir. Yeah. Okay, what? I'm totally ignorant of the real world in the real world influences here. The Phoenicians for one. Are are they are they largely Phoenician? Phoenician, Greek, I would say a little bit. Um, but th let's not discount the uh, the sea trade between the Indian subcontinent kingdoms and the Arabic kingdoms and uh, yeah. East Africa as well. Uh, there's a okay. lot of trade across the Indian Ocean there that we don't learn about uh, in you know Western history so much, but right. there were a lot of exactly. strong sea trading kingdoms. I definitely think they also have some elements of like the Dutch and the Venetians in there as well, um, just okay. to bring it into a little bit more recent history. Uh, both of those uh, kingdoms slash republic were... Uh, were very strong maritime trading nations at their height. Right. So right. there is that as well. Um, and yeah. I definitely think at least their cultural aspects seem a little bit more Indian subcontinent than... That was uh, the vibe I got. Yeah, yeah, than some, you know, maybe a European uh, uh, culture there. That said, right. I'm not as super versed in all of the cultures present on the Indian subcontinent, so I'm not going to speak as because if I'm in authority. Because they are diverse. Oh, yes. It, India is yeah. a very multi-ethnic and multicultural nation. Uh, yeah. So we've so. we've touched on... Well, I mean, I mentioned Shinar. We really haven't talked about Shinar. But the we've talked about the Aiel, the Atha and Mir, Andor... Tier mentioned tier. Um, do you want to bring up tier? One, I mean, sure, we spend yeah, a fair what, amount of time in there, so we get a good picture we do, of we do of what Tyran civilization looks like, and it's very, very top heavy. Uh, oh in terms my gosh, of, Tyran politics. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Man, talk yeah. about their uh, their common folk being super duper poor, uh, <laughs> like sod farmer level four. Yeah, I mean, so one of the par parallels I've read p 
people make between Tyr and a real world nation is actually one that's near and dear to my heart. And they say like, well, Tyr seems kind of like if you just had Spanish nobles running Korea. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that's oh wow, that's pretty accurate actually. And I mean, even in terms of the level of poverty we see, like. Uh, Korea during the Joseon Dynasty, which, for those of you who do not know, was Korea's medieval into the early modern period kingdom, lasted for about 500 years, almost on the dot, uh, so it was quite long-lived. Uh, yeah, the commoners were had a very bad lot in life, um, hmm. and it was, it was rough to just eke out subsistence living, even because uh, of the heavy taxes uh, placed upon them. Now, uh, another thing is, just like in Tyr, there was a strong centralized government run by this collection of nobles. Um, there was a king in Korea, but the king's power was highly limited by his council of okay, ministers. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. And that, that feels a lot like Tyr. Tyr doesn't have a king when we're introduced to it, but it has a council of nobles. Yes, the high lords who run things, and that's how that feels to me. I get a little bit of, like, Venetian stuff there, too, with, like, doges and yeah. things like that, yeah. things like that, uh, and possibly even some medieval Florentine politics uh, before the Medici took it completely over. So, <laughs> right. so I actually like that the Tyran high lordship had been vacant for, right. I don't even remember how long, for quite, quite a while. Yeah, but it was no not one. Even... No one lord was able to garner enough influence to take the right. prime spot. So it wasn't even there was not even a figurehead in the office. It was a genuinely empty token office to acknowledge a potential high lordship. Mm -hmm. You know, which is I like that he he didn't omit a head of state. Nor did he put one in who was just a figurehead. Right. You know, rather he had the empty placeholder to extenuate the political tension between the various high lords. Correct, yeah. And and, and gave Rand a great place to slot right in. Yes, exactly. And it, all of that was masterfully done mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. And it, it definitely played right into all of the prophecies and foreshadowing he sets up as well, right? Yeah. Like, and yep. it allows Rand to have his first kind of taste of political life. Because, uh, spoiler oh, alert, Rand, Rand is a sheep farmer with minimal education. Uh, and <laughs> he all of a sudden is in charge of a nation, for but he better has or worse. Strong, he has strong enlightenment values to uh, bring to their legal code. Does, does he? Does he? I, I don't remember. I still, it, still haven't started rereading Dragon Reborn yet, so I, I don't remember. Well, okay, so this. It, not I mean, one, super one of the, yeah, one of the most conspicuous things is in the middle of. Well, I guess actually this is the Shadow Rising mm -hmm. is when you see Rand administrating in Tear. Oh, before he leaves for the waste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right there in the Shadow Rising, as Rand is administrating a complex economy that he does not have the education for. Absolutely one thing not. he, yeah, one thing he injects is the concept of equal status before the law. But, but there's an instance where a commoner and a Tyrian lord, high lord, or not high lord, I think it was just a regular noble, mm -hmm. like a lower status noble, were in some kind of legal conflict. You know, there was there was some issue, legal issue there, and Rand insists that to their horror that the commoner has has the right to bring suit to a, to a lord, mm -hmm. you know? And so he's introducing this concept. And maybe you could argue that he's just being empathetic, as a commoner, being empathetic to commoners. That's what I would but, argue, actually. But the way that it's stated, it didn't have as vindictive, you know, or ret retribution... Like, it, it didn't have that note of retribution in it. Mm -hmm. It rang more like equal status. And that's a very, at least, early, mid-enlightenment value. Yeah, I agree with that. That's uh... Which is fair, because it is a roughly Renaissance-era culture. So, uh, let's wrap. Let's do a wrap-up on Tyr real quick, and then yeah. uh, move on to uh, Ilion. We can at least talk about... We can wrap up on Tyr by talking about their... 
uh, rivalry rivalry with Ilian, and maybe we could bring yeah. up Mayim, but Mayim plays such a small role on the global scale, I don't think we really need to talk about it all yeah. that much. And we don't see much of their culture. Yeah, I mean, we literally see the inside of a hospital, and that's it. Right. So. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, so Tyrion, econo Tyrion economics are a great segue to Ilian. Yes, And their exactly. culture. Another, another very seafaring culture. Right. Oh, that's another thing we didn't mention was Tyr has a strong uh, sea trade uh, right. based economy and fishing based economy because they're on the coast. Right. Because of the river. Right. Yeah. 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 So they they're a, they're a terminus for the river to the ocean. So they get a lot of sea folk in. Uh, they get a lot of northern traders, especially coming down from uh, Tarvalon and uh, Camelin yeah. and some of the Kyrian ports on the river there. Um, and so they are a stopgap between getting from there over to Ilian, who is their primary political and economic rival. Was Ilian largely the portal to the west, the western coast? And I was never clear how there were two major port cities. Well, there's, there's three major port cities on the southern coast. Tyr, Ilian. Ebudar. Oh, Epidar, that's true. Who mm -hmm. is who are west of Ilian? So yeah, we've got three major port cities. Uh, let's focus in on Ilian for now, and then we'll get over to Epidar. Yeah. Uh, but the relationship between Ilian and Tyr is interesting because it's so they have so much animosity between each other, and it's like right. it's all based upon their economic statures, right? Like um, they each are on the coast. Let me look at a map real quick here. Uh, because I cannot remember if Ilian is also on a river confluence, but I think it is. I think they are, but not nearly as large. Ilian does have some river confluences, but it is not to the extent... Tears River runs down like the Mississippi does through the United States. Uh, right. All the way, like, from, from really far from the north, quite far down to the south, like all the way down to the ocean. Yeah. Ilian has a couple of rivers it looks like that flow through it, but most of its port trade is going to come from trade with Tyr and Ebudar uh, and right. the Sea Folk. And the Sea Folk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Tramal King and, and Mayan and all those sea, sea based nations down there. So right. you can see where the political animosity is going to come from. Tyr has a little bit better setup being on the, uh, on the confluence of a river delta with the ocean. So uh, there. Although Ilian. Ilian always struck me as having a more developed or slightly more, I hate to say... I do think that their city, they at, had, at least the city of Ilian, is significantly more developed than the city of Tyr. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it may just be the difference between the level of oppression seen with the average person. Right. You know, because when you distribute power a little further mm -hmm. down the chain, you see general productivity dramatically increase. Yeah, so maybe that's why with maybe even a slightly less advantageous trade position, they generally have a little better standard of living. Right. Well, and I think tier. I think part of the reason too is Ilian is has more prime land trade routes than Tyr does. It's closer to right. more nations of note. Um you know, larger nations. Tyr has right. uh, an entire yeah. plain of like nothing separating it and Kyrian, whereas With all of their horses. Yes, whereas Ilian is significantly closer to like Andor and Murindi and yeah and uh, Gildon and those those nations. Uh, so it's got a little bit more prime overland trading as well. Right. Um, so they're really going to be where most of those landlocked nations divulge their goods. Right, yes. To, to, to the sea trade. Whereas right. Tyr, Tyr's the outflux for a lot of the borderlands, what's mm -hmm. coming down, parts of Kyrian, yes. things east east of the river. Mm -hmm. All of that's going to flow through Tyr. Right. So, And I think okay. this all plays that's into reasonable. just... Yeah, I think this all plays into what we were talking about either, just how well Jordan built his world. We're literally sitting here talking about the economic prospects of two fictional yeah. nations... Off it's of true. a fictional map, uh, and their fictional cultures based upon the uh, 
uh, differences in trade they've experienced over hundreds of thou uh, like hundreds or thousands of years. So, right. I think this settles the any it. any kind of worry that people may have. Is this a deep series? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yeah. 